call, and he calls, the reductionist project. According to scientific reductionism, human mental life, our consciousness, our intelligence, our purposes, can be explained entirely in terms of the forces involved in chemistry. As one great um, biochemist, uh, Stanford's Arthur Kornberg put it, um, he was ast absolutely astonished to find that many otherwise intelligent people have not yet learned that the mind as a part of life is chemistry and only chemistry. You see, mental processes are fully explainable in terms of the chemistry of the brain. Similarly, according to reductionism, the life processes are fully explainable in terms of physics and chemistry. That is to say, there's nothing else except the laws of physics and chemistry that are involved in the origin of life and its maintenance today. Um, and the principles of chemistry at a more complex level are explainable in terms of the law of physics. And finally, everything comes down to the moment at the earliest instance of the Big Bang when only the particles and the theory which governed their interactions existed. You see, at that point, at the earliest moment in the history of the universe, when everything was compressed into a single point, nothing existed except particles, forces, and the theory that governs them, and the vast explosion of energy that followed. Um, why didn't anything else exist? Well, what else could have existed? According to Professor Weinberg, the only way that any sort of science can proceed is to assume that there is no dive divine intervention and to see how far one can get with that assumption. That is, the way science proceeds is to assume that nothing exists except material forces, energy, and the relations between those uh, uh, forces, the energy and the material particles. Uh, matter, energy, the void is all that exists. There's no pre-existing purpose, no mind behind everything, or, or whatever. Now you see, Starting with that standpoint, it follows as a matter of elementary logic that everything exists today had its origin in the initial conditions at the beginning of the Big Bang. Um, that the vast explosion of energy and then matter that follows that is responsible for the existence of galaxies and stars, even though no one knows how galaxies were formed. Um, and that um, the interactions of matter on uh, the resulting uh, uh, planets, particularly on Earth, um, were responsible for life arising without any purpose by being behind it, that life became more complex on its own steam, and that life generated, once it had gotten started, generated consciousness and intelligence. To deny that this is the true story of the entire history of the cosmos is to suggest that something else entered at some point from outside. And to suggest that that could be the case says Professor Weinberg, would be to repudiate science. You say it would be to repudiate the whole scientific enterprise. And so that is why a critique of a particular part of that enterprise, such as the neo-Darwinian paradigm, is of no particular interest. Something very much like neo-Darwinian evolution has to have occurred in any case because there is no alternative within the reductionist view of the history of the cosmos. Um, if it didn't happen exactly as Darwin imagined it, it must have happened in some other way that likewise involves nothing but purposeless material forces, because until life evolved and became complex enough to have intelligence and purpose, there was no intelligence and purpose around uh, to have any effect on the outcome uh, of physical processes. And so, criticism of a particular plank in the reductionist platform is beside the point. Something very much like that must have happened anyway, and if indeed the theories run stark into what seems to be disconfirming evidence, that simply shows that they are incomplete. Because, after all, in many areas of science, there's great difficulty in accounting for the facts. The theories seem not to explain all the facts. That's a reason to look for better theories, but never a reason to discard the scientific program, which in its broadest sweep is the reductionist program. 
Persons who are trying to explain how memories can be stored in the brain, how conscious life can be produced just by chemicals in the brain, face many difficulties. But they don't doubt that the process can be carried out. Uh, otherwise, their work would be hopeless. Uh, persons who are trying to explain how life arose may find that their experiments all end in futility, that they're forced to work, as indeed they are now, with distinct theories that are mutually contradictory. Um, and they seem to be getting nowhere. No matter, life must have arisen by purposeless chemical evolution because there is no alternative. And after all, Darwin explained in principle back in 1859 how you can get a, uh, once you get life jump-started as it were, started in any way, you can carry it all the way on up to complex plants and animals and human beings. And if anyone wants to say that that's not true, well, they must be wrong because it's the only thing that could have happened. Now, I'm using this example of the program of reduction of science and the way that the, um, uh, Darwini the critique of Darwinism that the skeptic has made can be answered without ever really looking at the details of the evidence. Uh, to raise the question, is what we have here an argument about the facts or is it an argument about a basic philosophical outlook by which the facts are to be determined? It would seem to me, having studied Professor Weinberg's critique and having discussed it with him personally, and the similar critiques of many other people from mainstream science, that in a sense, we almost aren't in disagreement about anything scientific. Uh, leading evolutionary authorities like Stephen Jay Gould, David Raup, and a number of others um, uh, will indicate uh, that, in fact, um, there's a vast amount of mystery about how large-scale evolution could have occurred. That is to say, they will indicate this when they feel secure, um, that they can indicate it. As I've said, uh, Professor Gould at other times has gone back to insist that there isn't any problem uh, uh, when he feels under attack. But um, uh, the problem is that is simply that attack, um, that uh, there seems to be no doubt that there are many holes in the theory uh, but there's a philosophical sense that says something like this must be true anyway. Give us something that's better and we'll believe that. Until that, we'll stick with what we have. This seems to be a philosophical difference uh, rather than a difference in scientific knowledge. A difference in the kind of answer that one will accept. Indeed, a difference in whether we're willing to accept an answer that we don't know things. Um, and indeed, with Professor Weinberg. Um, it, it, what the disagreement that he had with me certainly didn't have to do with anything in the facts of evolution. In fact, he showed a complete indifference uh, to the um, uh, details of the uh, arguments over the facts. It was simply that purposeless materialistic evolution, the blind watchmaker thesis as I have called it, is an essential assumption that the scientific reductionist uh, uh, project must make if it is to pursue its goal of explaining all of the history of the cosmos and all of life and all of everything that has happened in the history of the cosmos in purely naturalistic uh, terms, that is to say, without allowing any role to a creator or God. If one is going to try to do that, one must make certain assumptions. Well, I agree with that, but why do we have to make those assumptions and why do we have to pursue that project? Well, that question now will bring me to the, the, next, uh, the second critic of uh, the skeptic's point of view that I'll mention, the philosopher of science and philosophy of science think. Because in addition to having had the honor of being criticized in uh, uh, Professor Weinberg's uh, book, um, uh, I had uh, the honor this year of being the subject of a program at the American Association of the Advancement of Sciences um, in which uh, a speaker uh, was the philosopher of science, Michael Roos, a professor at a Canadian university, the, and the leading, most influential expert witness for the evolutionist side in the famous equal time for creationism trial at, uh, in Arkansas in 1981, where the um, uh, Darwinists and the creationists had their, their uh, biggest battle in court. Uh, Roos had debated me at Southern Met Methodist University in a program uh, that was put together involving a number of people um, on my book um, in the spring of, uh, of uh, last year, of uh, 1992, um, and we'd had considerable interaction at that time. 
Well, as I say, in 1993, February, Roos was invited to do a program on me at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, I was not invited to this program. Uh, uh, with respect to the uh, AAAS, I am in the status not so much of, of, a, of a scientific uh, uh, examiner as a laboratory uh, animal, I think. Uh, <laughs> a subject of experiment and comment, but not one who is invited to participate in it. Um, uh, but friends of mine were at the um, gathering. The gathering was tape recorded for uh, sales. It wasn't an, anything that was at all private, and I received a transcript of the entire thing within hours. Um, and, and it was fascinating, uh, because Professor Roos um, at this gathering said, it, it re uh, first uh, engaged in some of the ritual uh, Johnson bashing that was expected of him, uh, but then, uh, very shortly into the program, he changed uh, direction enormously. Um, and he told the gathering that, in the first place, that he had had a, a very interesting time at the debate at Southern Methodist University with me and the other uh, persons there who were participating, and that he had found that it, while it was easy to hate creationists in the abstract, um, as he calls everyone who dissents from the purely naturalistic and, uh, paradigm of Darwinism, um, he found it hard to dislike us in person, um, that we seemed uh, almost disconcertingly uh, friendly and uh, 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 fair in debate. Um, and that, in fact, the subject of the debate was the question that I've just put really at the end of my discussion of Professor Weinberg. Uh, it was a, a, the question about the role of metaphysical naturalism in sustaining the Darwinist paradigm. That is to say, the question which was put, and which we debated uh, for three days in, uh, at Southern Methodist, was, is a belief, a pre-existing belief in metaphysical naturalism, a necessary component of the Darwinian evolutionary theory? I, I can put that in slightly different language that may make the issue a little bit easier for some of you un to understand. Uh, you might say, if, there, if we agree that there is no God, then we agree, don't we, that nature had to have the resources to do its own creating, because there wasn't anything else. And if you make that starting point assumption, you'll agree that, well, something very much like the Darwinian theory of evolution must be true, as it's sort of the best guess anybody can make about how you can do all that creating without a creator. But suppose that you're a person who isn't willing to make that assumption. That's the assumption of metaphysical naturalism. Nothing but nature exists. Suppose you think that there is a creator, there is a God, or at least that there might be one. In that case, do you have any good reason to believe that a creator would necessarily have proceeded on the basis of an accumulation of random genetic changes through natural selection? And the answer that I made, and a number of us made, was no. The evidence doesn't support that things happened that way, once you allow an alternative to the blind watchmaker thesis to come under consideration. Um, well, um, what Ruth said almost a year later um, in Boston at the AAAS convention was after having thought the matter over, he thought that he'd been perhaps rather naive at an earlier period in his life when he thought that the only reasonable thing to do was to accept the Darwinian theory as factual that now he was inclined to agree that it involved an essential metaphysical component, naturalism. Essentially, that our side was correct in that debate, and that you had to be committed to metaphysical naturalism to find Darwinian evolution convincing. Um, I'm told that when he finished his remarks, and finished saying this, uh, there was a stunned silence uh, at the meeting. And I know that his remarks were greeted with great shock because I recently read an account of this meeting. Um, it was one, at, you know, a whole morning session at which a number of people spoke on related topics. Uh, Roos was the most noted speaker of the group, but uh, not the only one on the program. Um, and uh, an account of the entire program was published in the Times Educational Supplement of the London Times um, just uh, last week. It's a very lengthy account, and it describes in detail what which was said by each one of the speakers. And it doesn't have a single word about Roos's lecture or that he appeared. And in, in light of the fact that he is by far the most prominent person who appeared there, 
and also the only Englishman at an American gathering. He's an Englishman who's teaching at a Canadian university. Um, the fact that he disappeared entirely from history has a decidedly Orwellian uh, flavor to it. <laughs> and I, I can't wait to hear from Michael what he thinks about this when I bring it to his attention. Now, um, uh, so essentially, I, I want to 